Okay, so for starters, the Warriors are already the runaway favorite for me next season. <clears throat> if things stay relatively static in terms of luck and health and things along those lines, I think the Warriors are the best team and I believe they will win. A couple of key reasons. Steph had a pretty down year last year, and he proved in that playoff run that that was the exception, not the reality. Steph is very much still at the peak of his powers. Clay Thompson is now going to be in year two coming off of injury. The thing with injuries is there's a point where you become healthy, and then there's a point where you trust your body. Those are two very different things, and there's usually a gap in time there. It is typically that second season after serious injuries where players trust their body again. I expect Klay Thompson to have a much better season next year. I know he had a rough offensive game in Game 6 of the Finals and he was inconsistent on that in that playoff run, but I thought over the last half of the NBA Finals, he was unbelievably good defensively, which is a great sign for his own physical health. I expect him to be better next season. Draymond Green had back problems. That the, he looked great physically towards the end of that playoff run. That is a he's most likely going to be in better shape going into next season. And then all of these young players: Jordan Poole, Jonathan Kaminga, James Wiseman, uh, Wiseman, Mo, Moses Moody. Steve Kerr is known to give a lot of opportunity to young players during the regular season, so that they're ready when the playoffs come. So another summer league, another training camp, another season of reps. All of those guys will be significantly better going into next year's playoff run. So I think the Warriors are the favorite, by far. That said, you never know what can happen. This weekend, we don't know if there's going to be some big name that changes teams, but it might happen. One of the one of the trades that I have lined up as a potential all-in trade for the Celtics is to flip uh, uh, Grant Williams and uh, uh, and Daniel Tice for DeJounte Murray from the Spurs. If they make that move, the Celtics become significantly better, in my, in my opinion. We'll dive into that a little bit later in the show. But the point is, is like there are all-in trades available for some of these teams out there. What if some team trades for Kevin Durant? If these deals are on the table, you never know what can happen. So for the Warriors, you don't want to do too much because you don't want to disrupt something that works but you also don't want to stand completely pat and then get surpassed by somebody in the process. It's a delicate balance. And the Warriors, obviously, as a luxury ta tax team, don't have a ton of options at their disposal. When you're this deep into the tax, you basically have four exceptions and then you have trades. You have the veteran minimum exception, which means you can go over the cap to sign any player to the veteran minimum. You have the mid-level exception, which is something you can use once a year to pay a little bit more than the veter veteran's minimum contract to go over the cap for one player. Then there's the biannual exception, which is in between, like in between where the vet min is and where the mid-level exception is, except for it hard caps your team. So I don't think the Warriors will use that at all. And then there's the bird rights exception. So you can go over the cap to sign your own players, right? That's what they'll end up using to sign Kevon Looney. Outside of that, it's just a trade. And as we've learned from, uh, uh, from Joe Lakeup and the people who run the Warriors, they're not interested in trading the young players. So I don't think that's going to end up happening this year. So, essentially, from a starting point, we know that they're pretty much limited to the veteran minimum and one mid-level exception guy. Let's start with who they have to re-sign. So, the three guys we got to keep an eye on this summer, Kevon Looney, Gary Payton II, Otto Porter Jr. My theory is that they'll keep Gary Payton and Kevon Looney and they'll let Otto Porter Jr. go. If it were up to me, I'd try to retain all three of them, but it's going to be tough because Gary Payton II and Otto Porter both played so well this year that they both could get a mid-level exception elsewhere around the league. So you're counting on one of them to pass on some money to stay in a very expensive city for less money. My guess is the guy that gets squeezed there is Otto Porter Jr. He had some health concerns. Gary Payton was more available. I also thought Gary Payton was better defensively. We're going to get into some of the numbers here in a bit, but Gary Payton II was phenomenally important to the Warriors' defense. Actually, I'll just do it. I'll get into them right now. This year in the playoffs, the Warriors were 8.6 points better per 100 possessions with Gary Payton in the lineup versus when he was off. They were 10.8 points better on defense when he was in the lineup. I thought he was vitally important to them. He hit just enough shots and made just enough plays out of the dunker spot and out of the short roll to be a valuable offensive player. At least not uh, not even necessarily valuable. To not hurt the team. Uh, like I said, they were only about two points worse on offense without him. 
or with him versus without him. But he was so, so good defensively. Like we talked about earlier when we were talking about the Draymond pod. Guys like him and Clay, Draymond, and Wiggins sitting on the right hands of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum testing their handle and turning them into jump sh- uh, jump shooters, pull-up jump shooters, was a huge swing factor in that series. Gary Payton is a flat-out weapon there. And Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum both had significant size advantages over Gary, Gary Payton, and it just didn't matter. That's how good he was defensively. So between those two, between Gary Payton and Otto Porter, I would prioritize Gary Payton. Also, Otto Porter Jr., realistically, there's a decent chance that a player like Moses Moody, who plays a lot older than he actually is, is capable of kind of sliding into that role come this time in the uh, when we get to the playoffs next year. Jake Fisher reported uh, this morning that Kevon Looney is likely to sign a deal about $10 million a year with the Warriors. I like that number. It's big enough that it's an like it's a show of respect to Kev- to Kevon for his commitment to this franchise. But it's not so much that you're strapping yourself for a center, which is like the running back of the NBA. It's the most easily replaceable position. I thought Looney was amazing in this postseason run. He defended extremely well at the rim and on the perimeter against guards and wings. He also was a dominant offensive rebounder. Uh, 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 Kevon Looney is really, really good. And it was very important for the Warriors to be the favorite for them to retain him, and it looks like they will. That's good. So now... We're talking about it. So let's get into their needs. We're talking about a championship team here. So they don't really need anything. But if I had to be really nitpicky about specific things, there are two that I had in mind. And these are the two things that I think they can target this offseason to try to improve so that they don't get passed by somebody who's more aggressive elsewhere around the league. First, something I talked about all season last year. That ended up not mattering as they won the trophy, but something that I think they should target is a mismatch attacking forward. If you guys remember, the guy I used as an example for this all last year was uh, excuse me, uh, Bojan Bogdanovic with the Utah Jazz. A guy who, when your best players are being guarded by big, strong, freaky athletic defensive wings, but you have another guy on the floor that's being guarded by a lesser defender who can back him down and get to the rim and get easy shots around the paint, like Bogdanovic could. That's a very valuable weapon in the NBA, especially in the playoffs, especially against switching schemes when you need to attack matchups. The specific guy that I really like to keep an eye on, if I'm a Warriors fan here, is Danilo Gallinari. So there's some intel out from Jake Fisher from Bleacher Report that Danilo Gallinari is likely, potentially, to be traded to the San Antonio Spurs in an attempt to get DeJounte Murray. Here's the thing that gets tricky there. He only has $5 million guaranteed in his salary. It's a big number. It's like $22 million, but only $5 million of it is guaranteed. They're going to probably raise that guarantee for the sake of facilitating that trade if it goes through, but still, less than half of his salary will be guaranteed in San Antonio. So you can be relatively certain at that point that San Antonio will buy him out. If Gallinari gets bought out with his injury history, he's likely to be a veteran minimum type of candidate. So I would keep an eye out if I was the Warriors on Gallinari getting traded to the Spurs, potentially getting bought out, and I would target him as another wing you could play that can attack mismatches in the post. Danilo Gallinari had 146 post-ups last year. He went 37 for 66 from the field in those post-ups, which is 56%, right about where LeBron was. Lower volume, but similar efficiency. He had 38 free throw attempts in those touches, and he made 36 of them. So he is a legit, super efficient post-up player in the NBA. He is great at attacking mismatches there, and I think it's an excellent spot for him to go. He also doesn't turn the basketball over. He only had 10 turnovers in those 146 post-ups. That is, that's a really, really solid, inexpensive, reasonable, and achievable way to fill a specific hole in your roster that could make you better. That's something I would target there. And then last but not least, it became an issue, not a, not a serious issue, it was a solvable issue, but they had to take Draymond Green and put him on Jalen Brown. They had to take their best backline defender and put him out there on Jalen Brown to uh, play significant perimeter defense minutes. This is where I think Gary Payton II becomes vitally important. They need one more reliable defensive wing that can take that responsibility so that Draymond doesn't have to leave the paint. Ideally, you, you can you, you could do it if you have to, but ideally, you don't want to. 
this is why this intel that they might lose him for the veter- uh, for a mid-level exception elsewhere around the league, that would concern me if I was a Warriors fan. I would go above the veteran minimum to try to retain Gary Payton. He was, I'll throw the numbers out again, they were 8.6 points per 100 possessions better with him in the lineup in the playoffs, 10.8 points better on defense. Gary Payton is one of the best perimeter defensive guards that we've seen in the league in this era. If you can retain him for the mid-level exception, especially with how effective he was in this playoff run, I think they've got to get him. So like I said, I still think the Warriors are the runaway favorite. I would bet on them to win the title next year in a static situation where luck and injuries favor them or don't hurt them. But you never want to stand pat just in case someone uh, supersedes you. I would retain Gary Payton and I would target a mismatch attacking forward like Danilo Gallinari for the veteran minimum contract. 